Hello and welcome to the DSP Project, the show all about music production and technology. I am your host, Rupert Brown, and welcome to the very first episode in 2011 of the show. Um, as you know, when we left off at the end of last year, I said I was going to New Zealand, which after a what took six days due to the snow in Heathrow, I finally got there. I got to see the sun again. The wife and I got to spend time with our friends, and uh, I got to see my family as well, which was really special. Unfortunately, however, I didn't manage to get any extra interviews while I was over there because we, we basically just didn't have time. It was flat out. The good news is, though, since I've been back here in London, I've been talking to a few different interesting people that we're going to be looking at through 2011, as well as I've started doing a lot of research into the new monitor upgrade for the studio, what I'm very excited about. So we're going to do a, uh, a whole sort of series on monitors and, and buying monitors that is, uh, should be quite interesting. So that should be something to look forward to. The first person we're going to be talk talking to today, though, is a guy called Mike Hillier, someone who I have uh, a lot of respect for. He's a very clever, very technical guy. Um, a lot of you are probably already familiar with his work and not know it, uh, as he works for Music Tech Magazine. He writes for them. Uh, he also worked at Metropolis Studios, which is a very well-renowned studio here in London. So uh, I stopped by with Mike and uh, asked him a few questions. So, Mike. Hello. Tell me about um, your early days. When did you first sort of discover a, a, a real interest in music? For me, uh, I probably got into recording before I did music, bizarrely enough. As a, I remember as a young kid, maybe eight or nine years old, having this really old two-tape um, two stereo thing and just wandering around the house, it had a little built-in mic, and I'd wander around the house making recordings of all sorts of silly noises. So I'd be recording the dog barking, or the toilet flushing, or my uncle snoring, actually, is one of them. <laughs> um, I just, so yeah, I remember just doing all, all that and really enjoying it, and uh, as, a, kind of as a teenager, I got into music, particularly in the the love of recording just kind of exploded from there. And uh, you just uh, what did you as far as recording music? Where did that start? Like a, like a bands or? Um. Yeah, it started as a kind of side project. I had a band, um, and we needed to do some recording, so I borrowed a Tascam Digital Eight track, and set a couple of days aside to read the manual. Learned how to use it. Had no idea what EQ was. No idea what compression was. Made a recording. Um, for uh, posterity, I've actually put that early recording up on SoundCloud. It's terrible. It was recorded to cassette in the end. The Digital 8 track didn't have a CD burner in it. The guy who owned it couldn't afford that. So we had to bounce it from the outputs to an Argos cassette player. Um, the only surviving copies of those recordings are on that cassette. I don't have any means of playing cassettes, so I borrowed a Walkman recently and digitised it. The quality's not there. But, you know, it's it's fun. It's, uh, it's the first ever proper band recording I ever made. Fantastic. And so when, at what point did you realise you wanted to take that from something that was just fun to something where you potentially sort of could uh, make a living or try and make a living from, so take it to that next step. I suppose at the same time, I'd, I'd always, as I said, I'd always loved recording, so I'd, I'd, it was always a goal, but I always thought of it as somewhat uh, unachievable. I, you know, I didn't know anyone who did recording. It wasn't like I could go and kind of apprentice anyone, or learn off anyone. So I was teaching myself all these things. I went to uni, I studied psychology, I figured I was probably going to end up an academic. Um, and But throughout uni, I ended up doing a lot of recording for friends' bands. Um, I ended up doing the sound technician stuff for the radio station. And I was really loving that side of things. So when it came to the end of uni, um, I knew I needed to try and find a job. And it just so happened that Music Tech was offering one at the time. So I applied for that and, bizarrely enough, got it. Yeah, and uh, tell me about running for Music Tech. Uh, it's something I've been doing now for about seven years. I do all of their Pro Tools tutorials. I do a lot of their guitar um, kind of effects 
reviews so and things like the pod that we were looking at earlier that's just been sent to me for review this month I do things like guitar rig I do tutorials for that started off just doing the news um, and kind of as I got to know the gear a bit better they let me loose on a few reviews and now I do mostly reviews and uh, so have you always enjoyed writing or was it just the the, the audio side of it I yeah uh, I hate writing <laughs> <laughs> I, I sit down with a blank page and I think all right I've got to come up with 2,000 words now and that every single time I've been doing it for seven years and every time it kind of gives me a little fear knowing I've got to come up with 2,000 more new words not the same 2,000 I wrote last time, but more things to say about a bit of gear, which, let's face it, most of the time isn't vastly different to what I wrote about it last time. So, you know, I've been doing this for seven years. I must have reviewed four different, four or five different iterations of the pod, you know. And, yeah, it changes in little ways, but they're always minor, and I've got to write a massive amount about it. But the good part about it, and the bit I really enjoy, is just playing with the gear and having an experiment. And it means that my knowledge of equipment is fairly cutting edge. I've always I've tried most of the newest stuff, which is yeah, you know, it's quite a benefit when it you can bring that to recording. You can be like, ah, oh, you need to do this. Well, I've just tried this brand new gadget, which does just that. So is it uh, actually kind of nice to get something that's really crap that you can lay into as opposed to uh, having to it's sort of say the same wonderful. nice things? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It doesn't happen very often either. Uh, manufacturers, are, especially the last two or three years, they've really put their game on and even the cheap stuff is most of the time pretty good or it's really cheap. And if it's really cheap, I always think it's unfair to just slate it you know if you're comparing a mic preamp that costs 50 quid with a mic preamp that costs a thousand pounds you're doing something wrong the thousand pound one's always going to be better the 50 pound one isn't meant to compete with it you've got to compare things like for like so a 50 pound microphone can maybe a 50 pound preamp sorry can maybe be compared to a hundred pound preamp and what we're finding these days is some of those 50 pound mic preamp sounds decent usable and uh do you think i mean that's that's kind of an interesting subject um something that i've struggled with do you think people get too hung up on gear and like having the the best gear over actually getting on and bloody doing it yeah gear acquisition syndrome yeah yeah i spend a lot of time chatting about that on twitter um i always think you, what you, there's a certain kind of threshold below which you can't do anything and above which the gear you're using isn't the limiting factor. Most of the time, the musician or your skills will be the limiting factor and it's getting a better compressor, a better EQ, a better microphone isn't going to change that. You're not, you know, you can get a better recording with an SM57 and a great guitarist than you can with all the microphones in the world and a guitarist who doesn't really know what he's doing. 